Uh, my name is Greg Herzog. I am a cloud architect with the vCloud Air team. And this is getting started with hybrid cloud. And uh, I guess based on the turnout here, it looks like this cloud thing is going to be catching on. So uh, you're all in the right place. So standard disclaimer slide. I'm sure you guys have seen this before. If it was later in the week, I would probably just skip through it. However, since this was probably your first session, I'm going to give you a chance to read it real quick. Uh, one thing I would like to point out while you guys are reading the slide is that vCloud Air is a service, right? So most of you guys who are used to dealing with VMware and packaged products, things like vCloud Director and vSphere, you're used to getting a release maybe once, maybe twice a year, right? You get one at VMworld, you get another one, maybe a dot release around Christmas. We have a 15 to 30 day release cycle with vCloud Air, right? So that means when we say things like features are currently under development, things are on the roadmap, they're on their way, we're generally talking within one or two quarters. I'm almost never speaking of anything farther out than about 12 months. So just one thing to keep in mind that this is a new service. It's not just a straight package product like you're probably used to dealing with. All right. So this is what we're going to go through today. Uh, I've just got a couple marketing slides on the growth of public cloud computing. Probably a skip right past those. Assuming since you're all here, you know why you're here for cloud. Um, spend a lot of time talking about vCloud Air. Um, some of the basic value points and why we think it's obviously the best cloud for hybrid cloud. And then we're going to get into the meat of the presentation, which is really the steps for getting started. And I've broken that out into basic steps and advanced steps to give you something you can actually do in the real world to go ahead and play with it. Because I don't know about you guys, but I've tried to log on to like Azure and AWS. Nine times out of 10, I get in there, I deploy a VM, it's like a Windows VM, and then it just sits there for about two months. Right? I don't do anything with it. So I'm going to give you guys some things that you can actually do to play with, get yourself familiar with the service, so you can go ahead and actually start using it in a real way. And then finally, I'm going to talk about uh, the five starting cloud use cases. Uh, these are the use cases that we've actually gathered from our customers that seem to resonate the most. So they're things you guys can start to think about to, uh, when you're going to decide how you're going to leverage the hybrid cloud. All right. So standard marketing slide. I'm sure you guys are all, have you seen the Gartner reports, the IDG reports, you know the CapEx versus OpEx arguments. Is anybody here uh, not familiar with why you want to move to cloud? OK, good. Move on. All right, so the nice thing about vCloud Air is that we are really targeting the customers that are already running vSphere on-premises. Right? So these are our enterprise customers. They've already virtualized their workloads. They generally have a virtualization first sort of policy. When you take that core and you migrate them to vCloud Air, it becomes a very, very simple proposition. And that's what I'm going to spend most of the time talking about here. So what's vCloud Air? Obviously, it's our public cloud platform. It's infrastructure as a service. We launched it a couple years ago. We started with uh, you know, basic compute storage networking. I'm going to spend some time talking about disaster recovery as a service, because this is one of the most interesting and highly adapted use cases that our customers are going for right now. It's a very easy and a very simple way to get started on the cloud, and it actually adds uh, real business value. Uh, the nice thing, and probably the most important thing about this slide, if you guys take away nothing else from this presentation, it's the fact that vCloud Air is built on top of vSphere. Okay? That means everything that you guys are already running in the enterprise on vSphere is fully compatible on vCloud Air, full stop. All right? So one of the things I'm going to talk about when I say, you know, move a workload to vCloud Air, I'm never going to use the word migrate, because it's not a migration. It's simply a move. It is literally as easy as power down a VM, copy it over, power it up, and it just starts running. And when I start getting into some of the advanced networking services and features where you get to keep the same IP addresses and the same MAC addresses, then it gets really, really convenient for you, especially in the DR use cases. Question. Sure. You do need to power off the VM? Yes. For the one I'm talking about, yes, you do. There were some things announced during the keynote today where you can do sort of the long distance vMotion. Yeah. Um, my talk is not covering that stuff because it's in tech preview. So I'm talking about things that are, if you logged into the service right now, what would happen? Uh, there is a roadmap session immediately following this. It starts at 2 o'clock, I think. If you guys go to your VMworld app and look at the hybrid cloud track, you'll see where the roadmap session is. They might talk uh, some more about that kind of stuff. But again, this is pure GA, what exists right now, not tech preview, not beta kind of stuff. 
Well, yeah, they showed it at the, during the keynote, right? They showed long distance vMotion during the keynote that you could go back and forth between on premises and vCloud Air or other clouds. So, obviously, super exciting. I've been waiting for that for you know, seven, eight years myself, right? Ever since you first motion, you're like, well, when can I you know, do it across country? So, I'm pretty excited about that. Uh, just so I get an idea, how many of you guys in here are uh, IT admins or IT architects? Okay. How many of you guys would consider yourself cloud architects? Okay. How many see a lot of new job descriptions and things being posted that do say cloud architect? Right, okay. So this makes things very easy for you guys, right? So to get cloud architect experience, the fact that you already know how to run vSphere and all that kind of stuff, it's the exact same tool set, it's the exact same paradigms in vCloud Air. So when you start using it and start playing with it, when you want to start moving your career into the cloud architect sort of model, you've already got to have the experience to be able to do it. vCloud Air is going to help you guys with that. We're always hiring. <laughs> All right, so I told you guys before about the 90 plus operating systems that we already support, right? So, what does that look like in the real world? Again, we're focusing on our enterprise vSphere customers. That means everything you guys already run, all your Microsoft apps, all your Windows OSs, all your Linux OSs, uh, your enterprise workload, your SAP, your Oracle, all of that runs, again, unmodified on vCloud Air. So we have 2,300 ISVs that have already certified over 5,000 applications on vSphere, right? Well, because vCloud Air, again, very important, built on top of vSphere and vCloud Director, that means that those applications are fully supported and certified on vCloud Air as well, right? What I want you guys to start thinking of, vCloud Air, don't necessarily think of it like a cloud. Think of it as just another data center that you didn't have to build. Right? You're not paying for power, you're not paying for cooling, you're just creating an environment with the networking and the plumbing and everything that you would normally do if you had a, a two-site, you know, sort of um, active, active data center or, or, you know, active DR data center, but you're just renting the space, right? You're renting the actual consumption units that you need. So if you start thinking about it that way, this whole talk flows very, very well. So in terms of OSs, these are obviously our two major competitors in the cloud space. We've got Microsoft Azure over there, and this is uh, data from uh, July in uh, 2015 of this year. They support a total of about 13 OSs, right? Amazon does a little bit better. They get up to about 30 because they support a lot more flavors of Linux than Azure does. Now, you realize here, vCloud Air, we've only been GA for about two years, right? But we support, out of the box, more OSs than both of these guys combined. Why is that? That's because vSphere has been around for at least eight years. Right? ESX has probably been around for 10 or 11. Right? So the technology's been there a very long time. This isn't brand new sort of tech in the cloud that we have. We're leveraging all our existing IP, everything that's been hardened and secured over the course of the years. Right? So where this might actually um, you know, be relevant to you guys is, um, uh, how many of you heard about the fact that Windows 2003 is end of life? OK. How many of you still run Windows 2003? All right, yeah, so I think the standard numbers are about 25, 30%, something like that, right? Well, so let's say this. Let's say you have a Windows 2003 workload. This is something super legacy because, I mean, granted, at this point, it's 12 years old, right? So maybe it controls, like, your passcode for your door locks or something, right? Like, nobody remembers who wrote it. It's just this application that's been sitting there forever. But it's sitting on really old hardware, right? You don't want to refresh that cluster. You just want to move it somewhere, right? Well, you can't move it to Azure because Azure doesn't support 2003. If you think about moving it to Amazon Web Services, they do support Windows 2003, but now it's a migration, right? I'm changing it from a VMDK to an AMI. I've got to rip out VMware tools. I possibly have to change the IP addressing, the DHCP, and all that kind of stuff. So when you think about where could I take this Windows 2003 legacy app that I really do not want to touch in any way, except to power it down, copy it over, and power it up, it really comes down to vCloud Air. And that's really where the power of our cloud comes in, especially for our enterprise customers. So this is sort of the, uh, the holistic vision of all the different services and um, th things that make up our cloud. I'm going to spend most of the time talking about the, the compute services. I'm going to talk a little bit about the storage. We've got uh, block and SSD storage. We have some object store coming uh, very shortly. I'm sure you guys have probably heard of the Google announcements where we're, lever we're leveraging their object store. Um, talk about disaster recovery a little bit, 
And then the other great thing is that uh, one of the themes of this talk is all the different management services that you guys are already using, your vSphere web client, vRealize operations, vRealize automation, all of that stuff views vCloud Air as a first class tenant, right? And we've made a lot of strides in making sure that all, you know, going forward in the future with all of our different software adheres to that paradigm. Right? Obviously, it was a little embarrassing when we first uh, acquired Dynamic Ops you know, a couple of years ago, and their first class tenant was AWS. So we spent the last two years making sure that you know, we're on par with them for vCloud Air. And then obviously, networking services. We had a couple really great announcements at the keynote today. I'm going to spend a couple of slides telling you guys about the advanced networking services that are coming out. Obviously, we got all the NSX stuff through the uh, acquisition of NYSERA. So data centers. This is another very compelling argument for vCloud Air. We have 11 data centers around the world. We launched two years ago in the US. We since expanded into EMEA. And then we launched and created uh, some partnerships and uh, launched in Japan and Australia. So why is this so important? Again, the idea is this is just a data center that you don't have to build. So a really great use case for this that we came across is we had a law firm that was on the East Coast. Okay? And they had some remote offices on the West Coast. So the remote users, they had Outlook, you know, connecting to Exchange, file and print, all that kind of stuff. Serious latency. Right? So obviously, those users were having a very, very hard time. Now, this very small East Coast law firm doesn't want to go invest to build out an entire data center or uh, rent colo space on the West Coast just for a few users. So they basically bought some vCloud Air in uh, Northern California. And they put the standard infrastructure in it that you would expect. So they put a domain controller in there. They put a DNS server in there. They put a couple of exchange servers in there, file and print replication, whatever they needed. So now the users that are on the West Coast have you know, low latency, local access. They're all happy. Everything replicates overnight because you know, AD is really good at replicating itself. So is Exchange. And so they're ever able to leverage vCloud Air to cross geographies. Right? So we see a lot of customers using that. The cross-geography thing is probably one of the most utilized use cases for vCloud Air. When you, when you start to go up the stack to bigger companies, it's to get into new markets. Right? So you've got a company that's US-based. They want to suddenly, maybe it's an ISV. They've got a SaaS product. They want to try some things out in Europe, you know, the London data center, or Japan. They want to see how the product's going to go before they invest a whole bunch of infrastructure in it. Very, very simple way to do it by leveraging the cloud. Any questions so far? All right. I, I like these things to be a little bit more interactive if possible. I realize it's a really big room, so you'll probably have to shout. But feel free to raise your hands, and you know, I'll do the best that I can. All right. So these are the core service offerings for vCloud Air. We have a dedicated cloud, a virtual private cloud, and a disaster recovery cloud. The main difference between these is that the dedicated cloud is physically isolated compute. That means you actually have your own servers that you're running your workloads on. This becomes really important when you start talking about things like licensing. Right? So you've got a lot of software vendors out there that say things like, well, I'm licensing based on number of sockets. I'm licensing based on number of cores. The only way that you can actually know how many you have access to is when you have physically isolated compute. Virtual private cloud, this is logically isolated multi-tenant compute. Everything's still separated you know, via all the VMware goodness, resource pools, and you know, VXLANs, and all that kind of stuff. So you're still not going to see each other. But this is more of the model of we have you know, giant clusters running in the back end, and everybody's sort of you know, taking shares of that. Okay? DR, oops, sorry. DR VPC, this is just a modified virtual private cloud. This is basically just a replication target. So what you do is you have your vCenter, you download a replication appliance, you, start, you basically go into your vSphere web client, again, exactly the same tools you're already using, and you say, I want to replicate these 5, 10, 20 VMs, whatever, into a DR VPC. It replicates. At some point, when you want to declare a disaster recovery, you fire them all up, and you're good to go. Very, very easy entry point. I'm going to talk about this more because it's, a, it's a pretty compelling and very, very useful. Um, this is probably one of the largest growths of adoption we've seen since we launched it. So there's a couple different paths to our hybrid cloud, right? So the first three ones that I just showed you a second ago were what we call our subscription services. Uh, these are really good for enterprises, because enterprises like to budget, like to figure out two and three year cycles. They want to know that they're paying you know, 10,000 every single month, and they can put as many VMs in there as they want. 
and then at the end of the month, they get paid, you know, they pay another 10,000, they keep rolling. I'm sure everybody's heard, you know, the sort of standard horror stories. The dev throws down a credit card, it's $5,000 for the first month, it's 20,000 the second month, they power off some VMs, it's 13,000 the third month. Enterprises tend to hate that, right? Because they like to be and have their budget be very predictable, right? Now, on the flip side of that, after we came out with the subscription service for a couple of years, we listened to you guys and you basically said, well, you know what? I do want an on-demand consumption model. Same as Azure, you know, same as AWS. I want to be able to pay per use, right? Maybe I have some bursty workloads. I got some test dev. I've got something temporary. I want to power on, do some stuff and power it off. So we came out with the on-demand model and we currently offer a v, a VPC on-demand. So the way that I think about these two is subscription is sort of a box and on-demand is a stretchy box. Okay, because you have to remember, you don't run a VM in a vacuum, right? You're not just uploading a VM into a cloud and letting it sit there. Especially, how many of you guys uh, run um, multi data centers? Like you're at your business, you have one or more different data centers, right? You don't just put VMs in the second data center. There's a bunch of plumbing and things that have to go along with it, right? There's a bunch of infrastructure, routing, firewalls, again, domain controllers, things that those VMs need in order to live and breathe, right? So when I say we're giving you an environment, we include our ESX Edge, or sorry, our, um, our uh, Edge Gateway with each one of the environments so you get all that stuff with you, right? So subscription, again, fixed box, put in it whatever you want. Uh, on demand is elastic -y because as you power on VMs, it sort of naturally grows. As you power off VMs, it naturally, it naturally shrinks, right? So back to the budgeting question. Right? So I said before that enterprises hate the whole, I don't know how much I'm going to pay this month because I don't know what my usage is going to be. Right? So we came up with a program called Subscription Purchasing Program. We call it SPP for short. And you can think of this simply as like an iTunes gift card. All right? This is something that you can use your PO, you can use your invoice, you can use your budgeting cycle, and you simply purchase a number of credits. And you can use those credits to burn down against any one of the different services that we have in vCloud Air. They will also work against any future services we have in vCloud Air, such as the object store, database as a service, all that kind of stuff. You can do these by purchase order, or we can tie it into ELAs. Right? I know a lot of you guys probably use ELAs out there, so we can tie in SPPs to those as well. And in addition, we also do support credit cards. So the customers that are maybe smaller startups that do want to do um, on-demand sort of compute, they can swipe a credit card if they want. We do support that. Does anybody know? <laughs> they do? Yeah, they do. So within your ELA, Cool. Good. Yeah, I'm, I'm like a total like, technical architect guy, so if you start asking me business questions, I'm just going to start pointing at Tony. I'm sorry? Oh, the question was, uh, do the SPP credits have an expiration date? And uh, with an ELA, they will co-term with your end of your ELA. All right, so let's start getting into some of the tech. All right. So let's talk about the compute service. I think this thing is actually incredibly important. You guys are probably already used to this, right? Uh, VMware's DNA came from the fact that we had these giant physical boxes that were using 10% of CPU and 10% of RAM, right? I mean, that's the whole reason we created the hypervisor, started virtualizing VMs. The whole point was to right size the workload, right? So in the cloud, why wouldn't you want to do the exact same thing? Because if you wrong size it, it's now actually costing you money. So if I've got a VM that needs 64 gigs of RAM, why should I also have to have 16 CPUs to go along with it if I don't need them? Right? So based on the fact that it's standard vSphere technology, I could do two CPUs, 100, uh, 120, 240 gigs of RAM, or I could do 16 CPUs and four gigs of RAM. Right? You can't do that with our competitors who happen to use the t-shirt sizes. So I think that this is a, this is a pretty powerful thing. The next thing is uh, vMotion and DRS. Again, this is real, really old hat to most of you guys, right? This is all sort of standard basic vSphere stuff, but this is where our power comes from. So if you think about you know, the security things that have happened over the last year or two, right? You've got companies that need to patch their servers. So what happens? They have to take down the VMs, patch the servers, bring them back up. We don't have to do that because we have vMotion and DRS, right? We move, the, we move the VMs over, we patch the servers that need to be patched in the cluster, we move the VMs back, right? And because of DRS, Everything's balanced evenly across the cluster as well. 
You don't get those situations where, because I happened to instantiate my VM at 2 p.m. on a Tuesday, I ended up on a totally overworked server, now I have terrible performance, now I've got to try to do it three or four more times until I find a server that's good. We don't have those kinds of problems because of DRS. HA, again, that's another obvious one, standard vSphere thing, server goes down, we automatically restart your VMs. That should be pretty, uh, pretty simple. Uh, the VMRC, this is actually kind of interesting. So when you spin up a VM, especially if you're going to take one out of a public catalog, right? So you're taking a base Windows OS machine. Would the first thing that you want to do be to open up like 3389 or 22 to go ahead and start configuring and patching that thing? Or would you rather patch it ahead of time, get it completely the way that you want it, and then go ahead and open up just the application boards that you need? Because we have the VMRC, we can give you direct console access to your cloud machines before they're even connected to a network. We don't even have to attach the NIC to anything. You're already getting your console access. And this leads into my next thing, which is bring your own VM templates. Right? This is the standard stuff you guys already have in vSphere. I'm sure you guys already have your own enterprise templates, right? You've got OSs that are hardened. You've got your antivirus agents on them. You've got your backup agents. You've got you know, whatever security and compliance says you have to use. Why wouldn't you be able to use those in the cloud? Right? So with vCloud Air, obviously you can. We allow you to upload these and then put them in your own private catalog and then just deploy them the same as you would any other VM from the public catalog. Right? So that's pretty powerful as well. And again, metered by the minute if you want to, standard on-demand stuff. Any questions so far? We doing pretty good? I realize this is sort of like a 100-level cloud thing, but you know, just making sure. All right. So I touched on this a second ago, right? Our software-defined our software defined networking is included with all the environments that we sell you, OK? We give you an edge gateway, and this edge gateway includes your switching, your routing, your firewalls, your load balancing, all that kind of stuff that you need to actually run an environment. Again, VMs don't run in a vacuum, right? So this comes with all the different uh, core SKUs, virtual private cloud, dedicated, on demand, it comes with all of it. The other thing is, we don't charge you extra for any of this stuff. Some of our competitors do, right? Uh, VPNs come to mind. For some of our competitors, you can buy a base level VPN, and I think it's like 30 or $50 a month, and it comes at a certain speed. And then you can go up to the next level VPN, and that's like three or $400 a month, right? It's additional cost. Another one of our competitors does the same thing with load balancing. We don't charge you extra for any of that. Once you've bought your initial sort of environment and size that you're putting VMs in, you get all this as included as part of that cost. Yeah? I'm sorry? Uh, the question is, do you need an edge license? No, you do not. It comes, it's part of your purchase of the cloud. OK. So let's talk a little bit about the advanced networking services. So very importantly, just to that gentleman's question, this is powered by NSX. This does not require you running NSX on premises. Okay? You get all the NSX goods and features and everything in vCloud Air, and you get to use them. That's the, uh, the micro segmentation, the firewall. We give you all the DHCP. We give you a VPN endpoint. Uh, we support dynamic routing inside our clouds, so, so OSPF, BGP for the out there. Um, we also support 200 sub interfaces. And this part is really interesting here, this virtual appliance. So remember I was talking about the compatibility of vSphere, right? Everything that you guys run on vSphere runs in vCloud Air. That includes all your virtual appliances as well. We let you upload them. We're fully happy to let you run whatever you want. We had a big bank in the UK that was using a checkpoint virtual firewall solution. Right? So they basically had centrally managed firewall rules, and they had appliances you know, throughout their environment, and they pushed the rules out to configure everything. So they just simply uploaded their checkpoint firewall into our cloud. They basically set the edge gateway to fail open, and then just put all the VMs behind the checkpoint firewall, and made their networking team very happy, right? because the networking team didn't have to change how they were doing business day to day. Right? So whatever virtual appliances you use, your RSA, your WAN accelerators, um, you know, firewalls, load balancers, whatever it happens to be. If it runs on vSphere, it generally runs inside vCloud Air. So let's talk about the replicating your architecture. Thank, thank God that says on-prem and not on-premise, right? So, um, <laughs> so one of the things that we can do now, and this is actually sort of a futures, it, it has to do with uh, the tech preview that was announced at, um, 
at the, at the keynote with uh, the hybrid compatibility, what's it called? Hybrid Cloud Manager? Hybrid Cloud Manager. You can take all of your on-premises VLANs and simply dynamically extend them into the cloud over layer two. So this is what that looks like. So think of how powerful this is now, right? Because there's a couple different use cases at play here. Generally, I was saying, treat your cloud instance as just another data center. So most of you are probably going to re-IP it in a different way. I'm assuming most of you guys that have multiple data centers, you're not stretching layer two across every single thing. Maybe this one's 10.1, this one's 10.2, this one's 10.3. You tend to do that for routing and things like that, right? So you would generally do the same sort of thing in vCloud Air, but with this, you don't have to, right? So if I have a DMZ network, a prod network, a database network, whatever have you, you can simply go into the wizard in the GUI and say, take this thing, take this network that's available to my vSphere instances, stretch it into the cloud, and it's extended via layer two. And it really is quite simple. This is obviously really, really useful for DR scenarios. Right? So if you can instantly replicate all the same networks on layer two into DR, when you replicate them over and then you, you, know, you fail up you know, your DR instance, you don't, have to change a, you don't have to change anything. It makes for really, really simple and easy DR. Any questions so far? Yeah? Uh, when you do the DR scenario, um, do you use like VPN tunnel between your site and... You can. So I'm going to talk about networking in a minute. We have two or three different methods for which you can connect to vCloud Air. Um, you can obviously go over the internet, which nobody does after the first couple of VNs. Uh, then you generally set up an IPsec VPN. That's actually one of the steps that I'm going to walk you guys through how to do. And then there's also direct lines. Right? So we have a lot of companies that do MPLS, VPLS, MetroE, that kind of stuff. They connect directly into our data center. And sometimes, in some cases, some extreme cases, we actually allow them to shut off the internet-facing portion of vCloud Air, so they really are treating it as just another data center with the, all the routes going through their standard IDS and firewall back at Corp. So there's a lot of flexibility here. Yeah? I'm sorry, what was that? No, you do not. So this is a function of the hybrid cloud manager, which they announced today at the keynote. The hybrid cloud manager takes care of all this. Now, if you do want the other NSX features, like the micro-segmentation and stuff like that on-premises, then yes, you would have to buy NSX on-premises. But for this, you do not. It comes as part as of your cloud subscription. And again, we give that all to you as part of the cost. Yeah? Can you still run SRM? Can you still run SRM? I have a couple slides on SRM. I'm going to go through those use cases. Uh, yes, depending on your use case. So again, that's a very sort of use case, architecturally dependent question. I have a couple slides on it, and I'll explain my views on uh, when I think you should and should not use it. So good question, but we're going to get there. All right, so let's talk about um, storage real quick. When we first launched, we launched with an SSD accelerated storage. Uh, we pretty much outperformed all our competitors immediately. Um, one of the things you guys might want to do is on VMware.com, we have a bunch of performance blogs, not just around storage, but also around CPU and virtual machine performance. If you guys want to go and look at those blogs, there's all kinds of statistics and things that we've run to show how we perform against the other clouds. In almost, I might want to say almost all, but in most cases, we outperform. So after we launched with the SSD accelerated tier, our customers said, hey, we'd like a lower cost tier. We don't necessarily need all that performance. So we went ahead and came up with a, a cost-efficient standard storage. These are a couple of things that we've announced recently. Uh, the object store, we made a partnership with Google. You still purchase it through us. Um, and I think there's actually a couple sessions later on if you want to go to a deep dive on how all that stuff works. I'm just covering it at a very high level here to give you sort of you know, the value prop. In the future, we're going to be launching another object store powered by EMC. So our customers have a choice. Do I want to go with the Google one? Do I want to go with the EMC one? There'll be different characteristics and costs, et cetera. Right? All right. So let's go ahead and talk about disaster recovery for a second, because this is super interesting. Uh, question before that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent question. All right, so the question is, can I mix my SSD accelerated storage with my standard storage? And the answer is absolutely yes. And not only can you mix it between VMs, you can mix it between VM decays on a VM. So if I have one VM and I've got, say, like a D drive with logs or something, I want it on SSD accelerated, I've got an E drive that's you know, files or something I want to put on the lower cost here, I can mix and match within that VM. 
The other really cool thing is that I can migrate that disk on the fly between different tiers of storage with no downtime. So if I decide in the future that I do need more performance or I don't need to pay the cost and I need less performance, I can go ahead and move the actual individual disks with no change to my VMs or application, fully uptime the entire time. It's a pretty cool technology. Good question. Thank you. I forgot that. All right, so let's talk about disaster recovery for a second. So this is based on our vSphere replication, right? So you do have to download a vSphere replication appliance. You attach it into your vCenter. And again, it comes up inside your vSphere web client. You set your uh, RPOs. They go from 15 minutes to 24 hours. Obviously, those are dependent a little bit on the size of the data, the rate of change, your throughput through the pipe, all that kind of stuff to, to be you know, what you can match. But they go from 15 to 24, uh, 24 hours. Uh, we do support initial seeding by a disk. So if you have a bunch of VMs, you don't want to wait for you know, physics to copy them over the internet. You can put them all on a NAS drive, ship them to us. We'll put them in the cloud for you. And you can start replicating straight from the deltas. Right? It's very, very easy to set up. And again, like I said, this is one of the, probably the, the biggest sellers right now because it's just such an easy entry point for DR. So, so let me ask you guys, actually. How many of you guys are fully confident in your DR plan right now? Right. If I walked into your um, data center right now and I picked any random rack and I powered it off, you guys would be okay with that, right? That's usually, by the way, how that sales pitch goes. And then 20 minutes later, somebody's signing up for vCloud Air DR. It's very, very simple. And uh, again, it's, just, it's almost like uh, an easy man's kind of DR, right? It's just a, a very easy entry point. So this leads me to your question, which is how does this interact with SRM, right? Is vCloud Air DR an, an SRM replacement? In my view, it's absolutely not, because I view it as two very different use cases, right? So you've got sort of maybe the smaller guys, or maybe the guys who don't have a fully fledged DR plan, right? They need some kind of DR. They don't really know how to do it. How about I just buy this service, I right click some VMs, at least I've got something, right? Again, very easy entry point. Then you have sort of the more operationally mature sort of DR guys, right? Like I've figured out the SLAs of my applications. I know what order they need to be powered on. I know how my runbooks work. I'm generally doing some kind of you know, fiber level replication between arrays and different data centers, right? Well, I'm generally using those because I have some you know, business critical applications or some trading applications or something that needs that level of redundancy, right? In that case, I would say, for a lot, of those, well, a lot of those workloads, SRM tends to be a little bit more expensive, right? So you only put your most valuable workloads on SRM. However, then you have these different tier three, tier four workloads where it's not cost effective to put them on SRM as well. Maybe they're on a, a lower level, you know, instead of a Symmetrics or on a Clarion or, you know, something like that, right? You could use vCloud Air DR for the rest of the tier three, tier four kind of stuff, right? So does that make sense to answer your question? I view it as, it, it's really use case dependent. Yeah, I was thinking the opposite, the more critical open cloud. The more critical what? I'm sorry? I was thinking the opposite, the critical in the cloud and the three and fours. Absolutely. So what I'm talking about really is like an operational maturity level for DR. So a company that's really operationally mature in DR and really has figured all this out, they're going to have a bunch of different options, right? They're going to have database replication. They're going to have run books. They, they might be using SRM. They could absolutely use vCloud Air DR if it fits. Right? But I, I also view vCloud Air DR as just a very easy entry point for a lot of companies which don't have a really well thought out DR strategy. Right? So again, it's really use case dependent. There's a bunch of different ways. I mean, the whole vCloud Air thing is incredibly flexible with different ways you can set it up. Okay? How are we doing? All right. Cool. All right. Any questions on that before I start getting into the uh, steps for getting started? You guys all good? Sweet? Having fun? Y'all look awake, so that's good. All right. So at this point, it was highly suggested to me that I should probably do a demo. Uh, how many of you guys have actually logged into vCloud Air before? All right, so very few of you. So most of you guys have not seen vCloud Air. You haven't seen the user interface. You don't know what it looks like. All right, well, I'm not going to do a demo. Because <laughs> I don't do live demos. <laughs> but I am going to do one better. I'm going to give you free access to the service. So by attending VMworld right now, we're giving you this promo code. VMworld 2015 VCA, go to this link, get an on-demand solution, and literally within 10 or 15 minutes after walking out of this room, you can be sitting there and playing with the vCloud Air service. Much better than me walking you through a bunch of screenshots or a video. Yeah, brilliant, right? 
I'm gonna have security throw you out. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead and take pictures. I know the little signs out say don't do it, but that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> I actually have a couple more slides I'm gonna ask you to take pictures of because they're they're really interesting. All right, so steps for getting started. I've divided these into basic steps and advanced steps. Uh, you could kind of go either way with it. Um, I, I said configure on-premises tools as a basic step, but it could be one of the things you do farther down the line if you have vRealize Automation and uh, vRealize Orchestrator. Orchestrator? Operations. Um, and then IPsec VPN. I put this in advanced steps, but this actually tends to be one of the things that most customers do first. Right? And that really sort of is dependent on the kind of company that you're in. If you're in a smaller company and you're like the vSphere guy and the network guy and the storage guy, it's very easy for you to open up firewall ports and set up an IPsec VPN. If you're in a much bigger company like a Citigroup or something and you've got to go through change control boards and meetings and stuff like that, getting those you know, four ports open is going to be much more difficult. Right? So I, that's why I kind of put it in advance, but really you could just kind of mix and match these however you want. So on-premises tools, I'm going to talk about vCloud Connector. Uh, then I'm going to talk about importing a template. Again, not a blank one for the reason that I said before. If you kind of just build a blank VM, you tend to do nothing with it, right? You don't tend to learn anything. And then finally, setting your, fi your basic firewall and that rules. So the first thing is, and I'm starting with the, 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 web, the web client plugin here, but it really could be anything. Any tool that you have, especially those that are from us, from VMware, that supports vCloud Air, go ahead and just start pointing it at your vCloud Air instance. Right? Start treating it as just another data center. If I go ahead and I click on this, I actually go down and I can manage my VMs from the web client without actually having to log in through the vCloud Air portal. Right? So I can power them on, power them off, do whatever I need to do, uh, get access to the console. Entirely within this, another joke is single pane of glass, right? We've all heard that. But it is, in effect, pretty true when you're talking about the fact that you, probably, you guys probably spend most of your time in the vSphere web client to begin with, right? So the fact that you don't have to leave it to go manage your vCloud Air stuff, you know, very, very compelling. Uh, again, these are just some uh, examples. You could configure vRealize Automation. Like I said, vCloud Air, it's now a, a primary endpoint for that. If you happen to have vRealize Automation, uh, you could build some um, blueprints and go ahead and you know, practice deploying things into vCloud Air. And uh, finally, uh, operations, right? If you want to do some performance monitoring, go ahead and take vRealize operations, point it to vCloud Air, install your Hyperic infrastructure, whatever you happen to be using. So that's sort of step one. And so I, I gave you three specifics, but it's really whatever kind of tools you have that you're already using, point them to vCloud Air, you know, start learning. So let's talk about vCloud Connector. So vCloud Connector is to transfer, again, not migrate, your VMs from your on-premises vSphere into vCloud Air. Why is this so important? How many of you guys out there actually use vCD, vCloud Director? OK, a few of you. All right, so vCloud Director has a Java applet that allows you to upload VMs into vCloud Director. Unfortunately, it's not really all that reliable, especially over the internet. So the problem then becomes, if I have a 50 gig VM and it fails at gig 49, I have to start over at gig one with the entire transfer. Right? That's pretty terrible. So our customers came to us and basically said, uh, you know, could you guys fix this a little bit? So we wrote this thing called vCloud Connector. And basically vCloud Connector is to do guaranteed reliable transfer between your on-premises infrastructure and vCloud Air. Right? And I'll show you the architecture for that in a second, because that's part of what you're going to have to set up. The other thing that vCloud Connector supports is offline data transfer. This is actually a function of vCloud Connector, so you need the environment set up in order to do this. But basically what we allow you to do is encrypt all your VMs, put them on a NAS drive, ship them to us, we decrypt them on the far side, put them in your cloud. So again, all the templates you're already using, that's a really good solution for that. That way when you're deploying workloads in the cloud, they're already hardened, they already meet your infosec security, all that kind of stuff. Right? So this is what the architecture looks like for vCloud Connector. Surprise, surprise, again, look where it is. You access it from the vSphere, the vSphere client, right? You do have to download a couple of virtual appliances. One is this vCloud Connector server. This is basically the mind or the brain of the entire operation. It connects to your vCenter. And then you download a virtual appliance node that you put at every single endpoint where you want to copy workloads to and from. Okay? This can be a different vSphere instance. This could be private cloud if you're running VCD on-premises. This can be any one of our vCAN partners who supports it. 
That was that whole, you know, unified one cloud thing. All the technology is the same between all our VCAN partners and a lot of vCloud Air, right? It gives us this true global network. And finally, the node that exists in vCloud Air. So there are two things I kind of want to point out here. So we, by default, give you something called a multi-tenant node, right? So you don't actually have to deploy this node if you don't want to. We'll simply give you an IP address. You set it up on your source side. We'll copy it into your cloud for you. You know, very, very simple, very, very easy, right? Now, the problem is, because it's multi-tenant, you don't have a lot of visibility into it. Right? Now, I happen, to be like, I happen to be like an IT geek, obviously. Right? So I like to have root access to my appliances. I want to look at the logs. I want to see the copy as it's happening. You can simply deploy your own node inside your environment, give yourself root access to it, and do it that way as well. So there's a couple of options between the multi-tenant node and deploying your own node. Again, use case dependent. You can use it however you want. Right? So I'm going to give you the non-scary slide and then the scary slide. So this is the non-scary slide. This is what you need to do to open up ports for vCloud Connector. There aren't that many of them. One, two, three, four, five. So we got about six ports. You got to open up to make things work. You know. There you go. This is the scary slide. So this, really, just take a picture of it if you want. This is just to help you, especially you guys who have to go through change control processes and things like that to get ports opened, to make sure that you get the right ports going from the right, uh, you know, the right appliances and servers out through the firewall. But again, if you look at this, it's, it's pretty simple. There, there isn't a whole lot you have to do in order to get this thing working. Yeah. Yeah, all these are going to be available. It's usually, what, like two weeks after VMworld, you're able to download all the slides. So this is not an under ND8 deck or anything like that, so you'll be able to download it. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I think a bunch of the presentations these days are going to have that link in it anyway, so if you just want to write it down, too, you can go do it. But uh, yeah, it'll, it'll still be in there. OK, so next step. This is the same slide I showed you before. But again, this is import a real workload. And I can't stress this enough. Because you want something that actually does something, right? Now, even if it's something very, very simple, rather than just building a blank Windows OS that doesn't really help anybody, like maybe upload a web server or you know, just upload something simple, a template from your environment, deploy out of that, then take the monitoring and connect it back to your on-premises environment, maybe do antivirus updates, just do something that has you know, actual ramifications in the real world. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? Has there, have any of you guys ever like logged into AWS or Azure or any other cloud and just kind of like built something and then just kind of left it there for six months? I think I have a bunch of those sitting like in a bunch of different clouds, right? So that's what I'm saying. Like, let's just do something real. You're going to learn a lot more. So back to the networking question. I think I actually covered this off already, but there's a couple basic ways to connect to vCloud Air. Uh, there is the just standard over the public internet, right? You know, very straightforward. There is the IPsec VPN. And so we support the standard IPsec um, protocols here on our uh, edge gateway, which means that on this side, we don't care what you have. It doesn't have to be another edge. It doesn't have to be any product by us. This can be your Junipers, your Cisco's. It can be a physical device. It can be a virtual device. Whatever supports the IPsec standard, we're more than happy to connect to. So again, the idea is it's a seamless extension of your data center. Keep using the things that you guys are already using. right? And then finally, you have the Direct Connect. This is your MPLS, your VPLS. This is generally when you start to embrace the cloud a little bit more wholeheartedly. You want the, the latency reduced from going over the internet, because IPsec VPN is still over the internet, right? So you want less hops and faster speed and all that kind of stuff. Question? Yeah. Uh, do you participate in Cloud Exchange? Do we participate in Cloud Exchange? Do we participate in Cloud Exchange? Uh, we just announced AT&T NetBond. Uh, we announced AT&T NetBond. Does that help? <laughs> um, one of the things, actually, um, I don't have a slide on this, but one of the things that is very cool, so because we set up vCloud Air with our partners, we are not building our own data centers, right? That means that if you want to, you can colo in the same data center that vCloud Air exists in, right? So we actually have some use cases where companies have moved their SAN arrays in, so that they can set, you know, they can build their web uh, VMs, their app VMs, and they have the databases and stuff like right there, right next to it, right? So the fact uh, the Colo gives you a bunch of uh, flexibility as well. So if there's some networking things and stuff like that, that's one way you can solve that as well. All right.
Moving on to advanced steps. So again, vCloud Air, think of it as just an additional site. Do all the same things you would do if it was a physical data center, although we make it easier in some cases if we stretch layer two and do things of that nature. Um, configure an IPsec VPN, I'll go through that. Uh, catalog sync is actually a very cool thing. And then uh, maybe some advanced versions of disaster recovery, and I'll show you why that's important. So I talked about this a couple times already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide. But the basic idea is, again, IP this the same way you would an additional data center. Put your infrastructure in there, your domain controllers, your DNS. If you want to put your backup servers in there, monitoring servers, whatever you happen to have, make it an actual useful site the same way you would a physical data center. So let me switch. Apparently not. There we go. All right, so this is the picture, this is the slide I want you guys to take a picture of or download. So um, the first time I set up an IPsec VPN, I read through about two or 300 pages of vShield documentation and another 20 or 30 in vCloud director documentation, and I basically distilled the entire thing down into this slide because it is incredibly confusing, right? So if, how many guys actually have set up an IPsec VPN before? Okay. How many of you think that, like, if you would go with vCloud Air, you probably would want to set up an IPsec VPN? Yeah, it's about standard. So we have a lot of very confusing terms here between local endpoints, peer ID, peer IP. When you're reading the documentation, they start to muddle, and it gets very confusing what's what. So this is just, I based this off a, a SharePoint application that I designed as like a hybrid, you know, extended application. The, the requirements were that the database had to remain on premises for data sovereignty, but I could uh, put the SharePoint VMs and the web servers out in the cloud because, like I said, the edge gateway is a load balancer, and you get that for free. So I could spin up 10 or 15 of these, direct all my partner traffic to the SharePoint here, and it would talk over an IPsec VPN back to the database, right? So that was sort of the, the use case behind this. Now, what happens, what gets tricky is your vShield edge that you have in vCloud Air generally sits directly on the internet, right? You have an internet addressable IP address. So what happens is that in order for him to get to him, all he needs to know is this IP address. This is why this peer ID and this peer IP here happen to be the same number. The local endpoints are simply the external IP address interfaces on the edges. So this one happens to be 10.0.150. This one happens to be the 69.194. The problem starts to come when he needs to know, how do I get to this guy, right? That's where the peer ID and the peer IP come in. So he says, the peer ID I'm trying to get to is him. The IP that I actually have to hit as my next hop is this up here, because in most enterprises, you're going to have some kind of external router, IDS, whatever it happens to be. So just having this as a reference in front of you, when you start looking at your networks and trying to figure out how I set up an IPsec VPN, is very, very useful. Any questions on that? It's kind of a complex slide. You guys good? All right, what do I got? All right. Next thing you might want to do is set up catalog sync. So again, we've talked about uh, you know, taking your catalogs or taking your templates, uploading them into vCloud Air. Uh, well, wouldn't it be nice if we did that for you? Right? So another function of vCloud Connector is basically to say, I want to choose these four or five templates, and I want to replicate them into my private cloud in vCloud Air. Whenever I change one on premises, automatically push that back up to vCloud Air again. That way, when you have your SQL devs or whoever your users are that are directly consuming resources inside vCloud Air, they're always using your latest sort of template, right? Just very simple, very easy, but again, as IT admins and architects, it's just one less headache that you have to deal with keeping things in sync, right? So again, that's a function of vCloud Connector, so you've already got it set up, you might as well go ahead and enable it. All right, the next thing is uh, advanced disaster recovery scenarios. So if you guys remember what I said when I first talked about the DRVPC, it's only a replication target. That means all your VMs are powered off until you declare a disaster. Right? So that means what's the first thing that happens when you declare a disaster? They power on. They start looking for infrastructure to figure out what to do. The first site's down. They don't know. Right? So, we're lot, so what a lot of our customers tend to do is put what you call a pilot light site. And this is a really good use case for on-demand because you're only, you know, say you only need two or three VMs. You don't want to buy a whole dedicated cloud. You don't want to buy a whole VPC. You just want to use the resources that you actually need. You put a domain controller here. You put your DNS servers there. Again, whatever the infrastructure that you need. So when this does come up from a DR test, boom, it talks to these things immediately. Everything continues to run. 
right? So if you guys do go along that uh, DR use case, creating a pilot light uh, site is something that's really, really valuable, right? Make sense? Okay. So let's talk about the cloud most common use cases. And this is what we found from our customers that uh, tends to resonate the most with them. Uh, I tend to think it's really more two and three in here, right? So number three, far and away, disaster recovery is the, the most interesting. Uh, existing applications, that was sort of the stretch share point that I just showed you, or like the law firm I told you about, they extended their exchange, they extended their environment, they're stretching it across the country. Uh, really good for dev and test, especially on demand. Uh, and then obviously web and mobile applications and cloud-hosted desktops, that's kind of an obvious thing, right? Uh, if you want more ideas for those sort of five use cases, these are the sessions that you can go to. Um, I'd suggest if you are interested in these, you do take a picture, because downloading this two weeks from now is probably not all that helpful. <laughs> and then we have a bunch of other hybrid cloud sessions that are not related to those five use cases, but are on the hybrid cloud track. Um, like I said, we have, uh, we have a couple deep dives coming up. We have a roadmap coming up. There's a lot of really useful information coming up in the next day or two. And finally, how many of you guys have heard about the hackathon that we have running right now? Just a couple of you. OK, so hey, we have a hackathon running right now. So there are two tracks for this. One is a developer track where they're competing to write an application you know, to be used in vCloud Air. And uh, the grand prize for that is five backstage passes to the VMworld concert this year. There is another track that's really geared more for IT admins and architects. So what you basically do is they're going to give you a list of different tasks to perform inside vCloud Air. Every time you complete a task, you get a different prize. I don't know what the prizes are, but I've been told that they're pretty good. And so you can get a whole bunch of uh, different things depending on what you do. Uh, obviously, the last thing to talk about is uh, hands-on labs. If you want to go play with vCloud Air, obviously, you could go spin up an environment in about 10 minutes. But if you want to go through the hands-on labs for this stuff, they'll give you some directed and scripted things to do, you know, real-world scena uh, scenarios and examples. So thank you very much. And it looks like we've got about eight minutes for questions. And please fill out the survey. Um, unless I was terrible, in which case, don't fill it out. It's not useful. <laughs> Thank you.